Hello, it's Dr. Reno again. We're going to be talking about cardiovascular disease for the veterinary technician. I'm going to start today by talking about heart failure. Um, heart failure is basically the, the um, end of the diseases that we typically see with cardiovascular disease. And it is when blood returning to the heart cannot be pumped out at a rate to match the body's need. This happens with myocardial dysfunction as well as circulatory failure. Myocardial dysfunction includes cardiomyopathy, something that is wrong with the muscle of the heart. Myocarditis, which is something that is an inflammation that happens within the muscle of the heart. Typically, myocarditis affects the valves of the heart. We're also going to talk about myocardial dysfunction caused by taurine deficiency in cats. Fortunately, this is not a problem that we typically see these days. Uh, because most of the food that we feed our cats um, is suitable and contains the taurine that they need to get daily in order to maintain heart health in, in their bodies. Circulatory failure includes hypovolemia. This is um, shock, hemorrhage, or dehydration. Anemia, when the um, oxygen-carrying capa uh, capability of the red blood cells goes down. Um, valvular dysfunction when the valves are not functioning correctly, and then any congenital or shunts or defects that cause uh, the circulatory system, the plumbing uh, within the body to either back up or shut down. Cardiomyopathies that we're gonna talk about, we're gonna talk about a couple of different ones. Um, the first one is canine dilated cardiomyopathy. It is the most common acquired cardiovascular disease. We see it in older male large and giant breeds, but also in English Cocker Spaniels. So that's uh, where there's a genetic component to it. Ca uh, dilated cardiomyopathy leads to the dilate, uh, dilation or dilatation of all chambers. What's happening is that um, the uh, cardiac muscle gets stretched, it becomes weak, thin, and flabby, which decreases the cardiac output um, the, the heart muscle is not able to pump as much blood out of the heart as we would want it to. So that increases cardiac afterload, meaning the blood is staying in the heart um, after diastole when it is uh, supposed to be pumping it out with systole. So it just stays in there and which causes a backup further in the system. And just think of it as a traffic jam. Uh, you have congestion on the roadways um, of your body, with the roadways being the circulatory system in this case. Um, the cause is unknown. Uh, there could be viral, nutritional, immune-mediated, or genetic causes uh, to cardi canine dilated cardiomyopathy. The effect on the animal is, is due to the low output, the circulatory failure. We'll see weakness, exercise intolerance, syncope, which is fainting, fainting from lack of blood flow or black, lack of oxygen to the brain, and shock. Um, also, they're going to experience some development of atrial fibrillation. Think about how if you work out really, really hard and you're, you're trying so hard to lift a weight and your muscles just start to shake. That's what happens with the heart as well. We get an atrial fibrillation. The heart muscle, the atrial heart muscle is so full and it's trying so hard that it just starts to flutter a little bit. And that um, those rapid irregular heart rhythms can actually lead to sudden death. DCM, or dilated cardiomyopathy, again, it's in giant, large breed uh, male dogs, usually from four to 10 years of age. Um, we'll see both right and left-sided uh, heart failure. More commonly in dilated cardiomyopathy, we see right-sided heart failure, and that's because the right side of the heart, remember, has a thinner wall to begin with, and so it's much more likely to be um, enlarged first. So we'll see ascites, hepatomegaly, weight loss, abdominal distension. Um, think of the traffic backing up. What does it back up into right away? It backs up into um, the vessels, the cranial and venal, uh, posterior, the cranial and caudal or posterior and anterior vena cavas, which uh, as far as the posterior vena cava means, it's coming from the liver, hepatomegaly. It's coming from the abdomen. Um, they're full of fluid so they're not going to eat as well, so they're going to have um, weight loss, uh, abdominal distension. With left-sided heart failure, if the left side is dilated, you will see coughing, pulmonary edema, and um, 
syncope. So the lungs get full of fluid. Um, you start to cough. The, the fluid, the blood is not oxygenated. You cannot get it uh, into the brain. Um, so those are the signs that we see. Also with both of these, we'll see exercise intolerance. X-rays may show an enlarged heart. Uh, depends on how big it is and how good you are at picking up enlarged hearts. Ultrasound is the best way to diagnose any cardiovascular disease. The chambers will look dilated and there will be other consistent signs with the backup of the blood in the heart. An EKG is going to cause a widened QRS and P wave um, with some rhythm disturbances. And if you remember why or what we're seeing on an ECG, we're seeing electrical patterns through the heart. So the QRS is equivalent to the time that it takes from the um, the electrical activity to go from the AV node. See, remember it starts at the SA node. That's where the rhythm originates. It travels through the atrial fibers, uh, muscle fibers, to get to the AV node, which is between the atria and the ventricle. And from there, it goes down the bundle of His, which is in between the left and right ventricle in that septum there, that wall between them. And then it goes out through the Purkinje fibers. Um, so the QRS is related to, in the ECG, is related to uh, the time it takes from the AV node to go through the bundle of His and out through the Purkinje fibers. And so if we're seeing an enlarged QRS, it's widened, that just tells us it's taking more time to go from one spot to another, which means we've got a, a bigger surface uh, for the electrical activity to go past. Treatment for DCM, there's no cure. We need to keep them comfortable. How do we do that? There are some basic um, uh, medications that you'll see again and again with cardiac disease. Diuretics is the first one you'll see, a diuretic like furosemide or Lasix. It helps to decrease the fluid load and reduce the work of the heart. Digoxin um, is a, we call it a cardiac inotrope or a positive inotrope. It helps to contract the muscle better. So it increases cardiac contractility and increases cardiac output. It's able to push that fluid out of the heart better. We do have to monitor the levels of digoxin when we have an animal on digoxin because it's got a very narrow margin of safety, meaning that if you give just a little bit too much, it actually will start stop the heart. Exactly what we don't want to ha happen. And now April is an angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor or an ACE inhibitor. That's going to become clearer later in our discussions. Um, from what I want you to remember now is it prevents the formation of angiotensin II. Think about the word angiotensin. Angio means blood vessel. Tensin is to tense. So what what angiotensin wants to do is constrict the, the vessels. What we prevent it from doing with enalapril is prevent it from constricting, so therefore it dilates. So it's a potent vasodilator, which helps to decrease the vac vascular resistance and improve cardiac output. It is making a bigger hose so that you can push more water through it. We need to tell the clients, DCM is almost always fatal, and most dogs die within six months to two years. Dogs may die suddenly of a malignant cardiac arrhythmia, something that cannot be converted. Um, then the disease is prevalent in, in some, it's more prevalent in some breeds. In fact, one of the breeds that's not on here, but we need to mention is a, um, uh, Cavalier King Charles Spaniels. Almost all of the Cavalier King Charles Spaniels in the world at age 10 have dilated cardiomyopathy. So it's very genetically prevalent in that breed. Canine hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Hypertrophic means more of growth. So it is a heritable thickening of the left ventricular muscle. It means it is genetic. Um, it's inherited from uh, in, in the offspring. Clinical signs, we'll see fatigue, cough, tachypnea, syncope. We may see some cardiac murmurs, maybe not. Um, sudden death, and they may be asymptomatic, and all you uh, all you see is, the, well, you don't see any signs, or they die suddenly. We find it through necropsy. Um, ultrasound, best diagnost uh, diagnostic, we can uh, take a look at it. There's no treatment. Sudden death and congestive heart failure is what we, uh, what we see. Um, breeds that we see it in, German Shepherd dogs, 
Rottweilers, Dalmatians, Cocker Spaniels, Boston Terriers, and Shih Tzus. Now, feline dilated cardiomyopathy, it is not common in cats. Um, genetic predisposition to cats that are fed taurine deficient diets. We see this in older mixed breed cats. They show signs of dyspnea. They'll be open mouth breathings, breathing, which we should never see cats do. They, they should not be panting um, in activity. They will just lie uh, there on their sternum typically with their feet tucked under them um, because their feet get really cold. Uh, because there's poor uh, circulation. They may be anorexic. We may have an acute lameness or paralysis in the rear limbs. Any time the cat has difficulty circulating blood, they have a tendency to like to clot those bloods, blood. So any time there is a slowing down of the circulation in a cat, we have to be concerned that they're going to have a, a clot somewhere that causes a stroke. Um, and usually where this happens in a cat is at the point where the aortic um, ab abdominal aorta bifurcates into the rear limbs. So we see a lack of circulation to the hind limbs. We'll also see some hypothermia. Again, they'll, they'll lie around typically either in the sun or with their limbs tucked under them because they are cold. We need to tell uh, the clients that if we are going to be able to treat these guys, we have to watch them very carefully for the first two weeks. It's the most dangerous time of treatment. If they do respond well to taurine within two weeks, it's got a good prognosis. We can diagnose this based on clinical signs by an EKG that shows us that the heart is bigger than normal. Um, a ventricular arrhythmia may be a sign of it. Ultrasound is the best way to look at a cat's heart. Cats can die during diagnosis. So when we're doing diagnostic tests, we have to be very careful not to stress them. Um, oral taurine is the treatment. Uh, we can also treat congestive heart failure. If they're already in congestive heart failure, we can give them furosemide, which is Lasix, to decrease the fluid load to the heart, get rid of that fluid um, uh, by in, encouraging the kidney to filter it out of the body. Um, oxygen, uh, obviously, if they're having difficulty breathing, we want to give them oxygen. Digoxin will help that cardiac contractility, improve cardiac output. And Nalopril is another, another drug we give to dogs with dilated cardiomyopathy. We give it to cats um, so it can help with that. And then anything that will cause vasodilation. Nitroglycerin is a drug that causes vasodilation. Hydralazine is a drug that causes um, vasodilation. It decreases resistance to movement of blood through the body, so it'll improve cardiac output. More common in cats is feline hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And feline hypertrophic cardiomyopathy will cause left-sided heart failure. Um, it's possibly related to some abnormal myocardial myosin or calcium transport in the heart muscle. We're not really sure what is the cause of this. We see it most often in neutered male cats anywhere from one to 16 years of age. Sometimes we'll hear a soft systolic murmur anywhere from a grade two to a three out of six. And we grade murmurs based on the, the amount of sound that we hear. Um, we can also diagnose murmurs based on where, on the left side, the right side. Is it near the um, pulmonic valve? Is it near the aortic valve? Is it near the mitral valve? And you really need to know your anatomy in order to understand where that murmur is. Um, murmurs, uh, grade one, you can barely hear it with your best stethoscope. A grade six, you can hear it without a stethoscope and you can feel it on the side of the, the animal's body. So you can actually hear the, the or feel the fluttering of the blood uh, passing through in the, in the wrong direction. Sometimes we'll hear gallop rhythms or some other arrhythmia. A gallop rhythm is when you hear the heartbeat instead of going lub dub, lub dub, you hear la da dub, la da dub, la da da dub. It sounds more like a galloping horse. Um, we can see an acute onset heart failure or systemic thromboembolism. Here again, we have that um, saddle thrombus or a thrombus that can, because of the clotting of the blood, because the blood is not moving through the body as it should. We, we can do an x-ray, but almost all the time when we see a um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, uh, we have a normal heart. Um, the, the thickening of the um, ventricle is happening on the inside, and we cannot see the inside of the heart on x-ray, but we can see it on ultrasound. So if we see it on ultrasound, that is our diagnosis. 
an EKG sometimes will show us that we have an increased QRS uh, width with a sinus tachycardia. So there are some signs that we might be able to see without an ultrasound. So for treatments a little bit different from dilated cardiomyopathy, we will use Lasix or furosemide, which is that diuretic that decreases the fluid load. But there are two other drugs that we will use um, that will uh, help this heart better than uh, something that, that helps the contraction of the heart. Remember, this is a thickened heart muscle. It's trying to contract. It's, it's generally contracting a little bit better, in fact. Um, but uh, so what we're doing is we need to decrease that heart rate. It's, it's contracting, but it's contracting too quickly. So propanolol, any drug with olol, I'll just tell you right now, is, is a beta blocker. And what a beta blocker refers to is the beta receptors in the sympathetic nervous system. Beta receptors in the sympathetic nervous system, when stimulated, increase the heart rate. So a beta blocker, like propanolol, will decrease the heart rate. It will also decrease the, the oxygen demand that the heart has in order to beat uh, at, at a faster rate. So propanolol will decrease the heart rate. Uh, Dilatiazem is a calcium channel blocker, so it's kind of the opposite of uh, digoxin or digitalis. It inhibits cardiac and vascular smooth muscle contractility, so it reduces the blood pressure and the cardiac afterload, so it kind of opens things up for them. Um, cats with a heart rate that is lower than 200 beats per minute have a better prognosis. The faster the heart rate with this uh, disease, the worse they, worse off they are. Um, with cats with HCM have heart failure, arterial embolism, and sudden death. Uh, often, if it's a, a younger male cat, they die suddenly. We have no idea why. Median survival once it's diagnosed is 732 days, so just over two years. Um, thromboembolism, this is that stroke that I was talking about, the clotting that I was ta talking about. It is a common and serious complication of any myocardial disease in cat. Here's the reason. 10 to 20% of cats who have a higher platelet rate activity anyway with hypertrophic cardi cardiomyopathy will form a thrombi in the left side of the heart. And 10 and in 90% of those 10 to 20% cats will those clots will then lodge as a saddle thrombi. So it's lodging in the, uh, the bifurcation of the vessels that go to the rear limbs. So what we'll see is an onset of rear leg pain and paresis, meaning very weak legs. They'll have cold bluish foot pads. Remember, there's no um, blood going to these, uh, um, there's no vessels going to these rear limbs. We won't feel pulses in the rear limbs. Um, and there's going to be a history or, or clinical findings of myocardial disease. It's very painful, um, and it's very difficult to treat. So uh, we can do angiography if we really want to diagnose it. Honestly, it's pretty easy to diagnose by the way the cat is acting. There is a treatment that will work. It's the same treatment they use for stroke victims at the hospital. But if you know anything about human medicine, you know that TPA has to be given um, within a certain time period so that the fibrolysin results in the breakdown of the clots um, before we have uh, tissue damage. If we don't get it by a certain time period, it's possible that we're going to lose um, some of the tissue in the, limb, uh, in the limbs, or at least the activity of the limbs. We can use heparin, but it, it's kind of a preventive medication. It acts on coagulation factors in both the intrinsic and extrinsic coagulation pathways, which inhibits the formation of a stable clot which means that clot can break up, be broken up into to smaller pieces, but those little pieces can get stuck other places. And so heparin doesn't really work for treatment of a serious uh, clot. Um, if we can diagnose this uh, a heart condition earlier, putting the animal on baby aspirin every three days, cats are very, very sensitive to any non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, so we have to only give it every three days. Uh, but it can it can uh, prevent this complication. Um, so we need to let clients know that cats with painful, cold, or paralyzed rear legs are an emergency. Prognosis is guarded to poor, and there's really no um, no way to treat it. We can try surgery, but it's a very difficult surgery that needs to be done by a specialist. Congenital heart disease. These are malformations of the heart and great vessels. Um, there are genetic, environmental, infection 
uh, infectious, nutritional, and drug-related causes of congenital heart disease. There are several that we're going to talk about. The first one is patent ductus arteriosus, and this is the failure of the ductus arteriosus to close. Now you're going to ask me the question, what is a ductus arteriosus? And I will tell you, a ductus arteriosus is a, in a fetus, a normal vessel that shunts around the lungs. Remember, they don't need to use their lungs while they're in the womb. So it goes from the pulmonic artery, which comes out of the right ventricle, and it goes directly, it is a bypass highway directly to the aorta of, that comes out of the left ventricle of the heart. So it bypasses the lung um, in, uh, completely. Now, as the animals are born, that ductus arteriosus is supposed to close. If it doesn't, it's called patent, or it's, it's still viable. What we will hear in these dogs, and it's more prevalent in Chihuahuas, Collies, Maltese, Poodles, Pomeranians, English Springers, Kishons, Bichons, uh, Shetland Sheepdogs, we're gonna hear this loud machinery murmur. What is a machinery murmur? Well, you can Google this, you can listen to it on YouTube, but I will make that sound for you here. What it sounds like is a <laughs> kind of like a washing machine. Washing, 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 washing. And it happens over the left thorax. Um, some pups are asymptomatic. They have no, no problems with it. Sometimes it will close shortly after birth. So if we hear it in a young pup, we keep an, uh, an ear out for it. Sometimes it will actually close. Um, we can di diagnose it with an ECG, ECG. If we're seeing left ventricular dilatation, aortic or pulmonary uh, artery dilatation, seeing signs of that in the x-ray or in the ECG, um, that's just telling us that we do have uh, some problems secondary to the patent ductus arteriosus or PDA. In order to treat it, we do need to do a surgical correction before they are two years of age. So often we're doing these in very tiny puppies needs to be done by a specialist. The prognosis is excellent with surgical correction, but 64% of them will be dead within one year if we don't correct it. We need to tell our clients that if they have a PDA dog, we do not want to use them for breeding, and we want to look very carefully at the genetics that we're using, that we use to get this breeding, and make sure we're not um, mixing those two dogs again. Atrial and ventricle defects. They're fairly common in the cat. Uh, these are holes within the heart. Now, again, with the shunting of the heart from left to right, uh, or I'm sorry, from right to left, because we have uh, no need to go through the lungs, that happens in the fetus, but these defects in the walls of the between the atria and the ventricles need to need to close by the time they are uh, born. Um, ASDs or atrial, VSDs are ventricle. In ASDs, the blood shunts from the left to the right, and I'll show you a picture of that. In VSDs, they shunt from the right to the left. There are some typical breeds. Bengals are one of the breeds um, that get these. What you'll see is with the ASD is, or what you'll hear is a soft systolic murmur, um, split second heart sound. Split second means that you're hearing a love to dub, love to dub, love to dub, or love to dub, love to dub. That's a soft murmur. A VSD is a harsh holosystolic murmur on the right sternal uh, border where that those ventricles are are um, actually located, and you'll it'll be a so it's a lot harsher than an ASD. Um, we may see signs of congestive heart failure before they're even eight weeks of age. Treatment, basically, with either one, we have to do a medical management of CHF. It is possible to repair the defects, but that requires open heart surgery or cardiopulmonary bypass. Most animals will eventually uh, experience development of congestive heart failure and require treatment. Um, X-rays will sometimes show us some differences. ASD will show a right-sided heart enlargement. Remember, blood is shunting from the left to the right-hand side. Um, and some increased pulmonary vascularity. Left atrium is normal to slightly enlarged. Um, the VSD, we're going to see pulmonary overcirculation uh, as well. Some left atrium and ventricular enlarged. Remember, it's shunting from the right to the left. And sometimes some right ventricular enlargement just because of the backup um, of the congestion of the heart. Um, again, echocardiography or ultrasound is the best way to look at the septal defects. So here's a picture of the heart um, as it would uh, uh, lie in the body if you're looking at the side of the animal with their feet on the ground. 
the right ventricle and our uh, right uh, artery tends to be on the right side, but on the at the, on the ventral portion of the animal, whereas the left is on the left side, but it's also on the dorsum. Um, so when you're looking at it, the left atrium is a little bit above the right atrium, and uh, the hole between the heart, uh, ca this causes the blood to go from the left side to the right side, and on the uh, ventral, if there's a hole in the ventrum, ventricle, in the septum of the ventricle, we have uh, the blood shunting from the right side to the left side. And of course, it's usually a much bigger hole in the ventricle, much bigger area, and so it's a lot more blood that's shunting. So again, this is common in cat. A pulmonic stenosis, let me go back to this picture and show you where that happens. Pulmonary artery. The pulmonary artery, remember, comes out of the right ventricle and goes to the left and right lungs, right and left lungs. If it's stenotic, what does stenosis mean? Stenosis means a narrowing of. So if it's stenotic, that means it's a narrowing of this pulmonic artery right as it comes out of the right ventricle. What will happen? Um, what will happen is we have a decreased outflow tract. So things, it's smaller. It's not getting out of the, the blood's not getting out of the right ventricle. So it will back up into the right ventricle, which causes an increase in systolic pressure, an increase in the size of the heart, um, uh, an increase in the, the um, right atrium as well. Everything, the traffic is backing up. Uh, common breeds would be Chihuahua, Samoyed, English Bulldog, Mini Schnauzer, Lab, Massive, Chow Chow, Newfoundland, Basset Hound, Terriers, and Spaniels. We will see these signs at less than a year. We may see syncope, tiring on exercise, right-sided congested heart failure, prominent jugular pulse. Remember, it's backing up into the right side. What comes into the right side, the crania cranial and caudal vena cava, what empties into the, you gotta back up on those on those streets, um, back up to the jugular, comes right out of the cranial vena cava, um, or it empties in the cranial vena cava. So it's backing out into the jugular pulse. You may hear a murmur, a left basal murmur. So that's a, a, a murmur on the left side near the base of the heart. Um, you may actually feel right ventricular enlargement. You may actually feel it beating up against the right side of the, the uh, heart or the chest. Um, diagnosis, you may see these signs on x-ray. So a right ventricular enlargement, post stenotic dilatation of the pulmonary artery, pulmonary underperfusion. We're not getting the blood out of that right side and into the lungs. On echo, ultrasound, we see exactly what's going on. The right side is bigger. It's hypertrophied. We're seeing um, increased echogenicity, which means it's um, uh, brighter on the pulmonary valves. Uh, we get a uh, main, we have a dilatation of the main pulmonary artery, so it's very clear. Uh, we can do a balloon valvuloplasty to relieve the obstruction, just like they do with humans when we have obstructed um, vessels. We stick a balloon on a catheter all the way up into the heart, in the vessels of the heart, and blow it up and stretch that pulmonic stenosis. We can also do a valvulotomy or a partial valvulectomy. Otomy means make a hole in it, so you make an extra hole there so uh, blood can flow through, or you can remove a um, part of the valve to open it up a little bit. You can also do a patch graft over the outflow tract, so you can take a piece of a vessel from somewhere else in the body, make that vessel a little bit larger, and graft um, over top. Do not breed these animals. Um, if they have a mild to moderate pulmonic, pulmonic stenosis, they can live very normal lives. But if it's moderate to severe, sudden death can occur. Here's a picture of a heart. It's a, an x-ray. And this is just to, um, to show you that you can see the heart. We call this the heart shadow. And you can see the outside of the heart very, very well, but you can't see inside the heart. This black area here, we've got the spine, we've got the diaphragm, we have the heart, and we have the lungs. The black area is the lungs, and it should be black. There's air in there. There's lots of air in there, so x-rays will go directly through there and darken the, the film. It's The x-rays are bouncing off the heart more, and so these will be a little bit brighter. Um, we have the ribs over here. This black area, this black line here, is the trachea, and then the trachea bifurcates into um, bronchia, bronchi, mainstem bronchi, and then bronchioles. Around each bronchi, 
you will actually see vessels. On top will be the artery, on the bottom will be the, ve uh, the vein. If the vein is larger than the artery, then we have venous congestion, which means we have a traffic backup, which means our heart is not beating normally. So we do look at that. We look at the difference between the size of the artery and the vein. And in this case, you can actually see that the vein is about twice the size of the artery. So we do have some venous congestion. Our heart is a little bit wider than normal. Um, so we are, um, this is suggestive of heart failure. A subaortic stenosis. So same as a pulmonic stenosis, we have a decrease in the outflow, but we have it at a di different place. It's coming back into the left ventricle. Here's the aorta. And the stenosis or the narrowing happens just above the aortic valve. Also common in dogs, Newfies, Boxers, um, German Shepherd dogs, Golden Retrievers, and Bull Terriers. Um, everything that happens on the right side of the heart with pulmonic stenosis is going to happen with subaortic stenosis as well. We may hear a soft or moderately loud ejection murmur in, in uh, the fourth left intercostal area in between the, the fourth and fifth ribs. We may see exertional tiring. They may get tired easily. Syncope, left-sided congestive heart failure, and sudden death. Diagnosis, x-rays, again, don't show us a whole lot, but we may see some um, widening of the mediastinum. That is the word that um, describes the space between the lungs in which the heart, the trachea, major vessels, nerves, and uh, lymph nodes lie. So we may see an, um, a widening of that area. We may see a, a increase of the left ventricle, uh, but it can also look normal. An echocardiogram, cardiogram, again, is where you're going to see the actual picture of what's going on. Uh, treatment is to restrict exercise. We may, need, we may be able to do a balloon catheter um, dilation of the uh, stenotic ring. We do not want to breed these dogs. Most of these guys will experience development of left-sided cardiac uh, congestive heart failure, which is a sudden onset and sudden death. Remember, this is in the aorta, the major artery of the heart. Tetralogy of Fallot is a term for a polygenic, meaning multiple genes um, affect this. It's genetically transmitted malformation that is, has several components. So four components. Tetralogy means four. Fallot is the guy who found all four components. Pulmonic stenosis, we just talked about that. Um, secondary right ventricular hypertrophy, the pulmonic stenosis. Remember, we said that, that it was something that happens because we have a backup in the pulmonic artery. Subaortic ventricular septal defect. So that's happening um, within the uh, septum of the uh, ventricle between the right and the left sides. Overriding aorta. So it's coming over that spot. So we're, we're getting basically a backup of the heart on all sides. Um, this typically can be found in English Bulldogs, Kishans, and in the cat. Um, signs are due to an increased right-sided resistance and pressure and right to left shunt between the pulmonary and systemic circulations. So we'll see a failure to grow. They'll be cyanotic or blue, no, not enough oxygen to the tissue. Exercise intolerance, shortness of breath, weakness, syncope, seizures, and sudden death. Diagnosis, we may see some changes in x-ray, not often. Um, generally, these are pretty young animals. Um, we could do uh, surgical cre um, treatment. We can create a systemic pulmonary systemic um, or a pulmonary systemic shunt. Um, medically, we can do phlebotomy, which is drawing blood. And we do that to maintain a packed cell volume of, uh, between 62% and 68%. The problem with this malformation is it actually increases the red blood cells um, just because of the feedback mechanism. And so when it increases the red blood cells, um, it's actually increasing the, um, the, the uh, it's actually decreasing the relative oxygen need, um, needed for these red blood cells, but it's uh, increasing the clotting uh, effect. Um, so when we do a phlebotomy, we're gonna, we're gonna decrease, um, we're gonna actually bleed them out and then replace that with crystalloid fluids. We're, we're diluting their blood a little bit. If they have hypoxia, obviously we're going to treat with cage rest and oxygen. Obviously, we don't want to breed these guys. Sudden death is common, but some of these guys can tolerate it for years. Congestive heart failure is rare because they'll usually die before they get congestive heart failure. 
Um, we need to limit stress and exercisers. exercise. Never give them tranquilizers or sedatives. They need regular phlebotomies. So if you're a vampire, th these are the dogs and cat to get for you. Okay? So tetralogy of flow. A persistent right aortic arch or a va other, any other vascular ring anomalies. So what happens is, remember, we have a lot of this shunting of blood when they're in the fetus. And if we, if those, aor this right aortic arch, if that stays in place and we don't lose it, um, and then we have growth of the animal, the esophagus and everything in there gets bigger, but this persistent right aortic arch does not. So it, it actually encircles the esophagus and uh, keeps it shut. So it becomes stenotic. Um, we can see this in German Shepherd dogs, uh, Irish Setters, and Great Danes. What happens, what we see is that they will regurgitate solid food. So they'll be eating, and then they'll open their mouth, and food will fall out because it can't get past that smaller area. This will then cause a, um, an increased possibility of aspiration pneumonia, fever, dyspnea, cough, weight loss. Um, it, we can diagnose it with a barium swallow. So we give them some barium and right away we take an x-ray and look at it going through their esophagus. Now, because if we give them liquid, it won't always show up. If we mix it with food, it will cause the esophagus to get a little bit better, strip, uh, bigger, it'll stretch a little bit so we can see if there's a constriction there. Uh, if we can do surgery as early as possible, we can do surgery to remove that. It's a similar surgery to a PDA. Um, we can just maintain them with this if we feed them a less solid diet or a smaller um, or a pelleted diet, we give them small amounts more frequently. We can feed them from a height. What, what this means is we sit them up so that gravity helps to bring the smaller things down into their stomach and get past that stricture in their esophagus. And then if they have any respiratory infections from an aspiration pneumonia, give them antibiotics. We need to tell the clients that without surgical correction, prognosis is poor. And even with surgical correction, there is a small amount of esoph esophageal dilatation or dilation that will persist. And the esophagus, if it's not able to constrict properly, they will be more prone to um, regurgitate. Again, no breeding of these animals. All right, going from genetic to a uh, acquired valvular disease. These are considered acquired because uh, these are diseases that the animal will get over time or because of a certain disease. The, um, the major ones we're gonna talk about, chronic mitral valve insufficiency and tricuspid valve insufficiency. Now the easy thing is you'll see similar signs with both of these, they'll just be on uh, in opposite sides of the heart. So the mitral valve is where? On the left side of the heart. The tricuspid valve is where? It's on the right side of the heart. So you have to remember left-sided failure, right-sided failure, what are the signs that you see? So CMVI or chronic mitral valve insufficiency is the most commonly seen cardio disorder in dogs. Uh, remember I said the most common cardiomyopathy in dogs is dilated cardiomyopathy. This is the most commonly see cardio disorder. Uh, prevalence increases with age. 75% of all dogs older than 16 years have CMVI. It's rare in cats. It is progressive. So once they have it, it results in 85% of all cases of uh, congestive heart failure in small breed dogs. What do we see? We see proliferation of fibroblastic tissue within the structure of the valve leaf leaflets. Let look, let's look at that word fibroblastic. It means scar tissue, basically. So we have an infection on, and that causes this nodular thickening of the valvular edges. They contract, they roll up because the infection causes tissue damage, and then we get scar tissue in there, and it just contracts up that valve, and it makes that valve, which should close like a nice even door, um, close with the edges together. They can't close sufficiently during systole, so then we get regurgitation backing up into the left atrium. Then we get a dilated left atrium. Sometimes even the left ventricle gets dilated, and it leads to pulmonary congestion, compression of the left main stem bronchus, which then will cause cough and dyspnea, especially when they're lying down. So you, you have this pulmonary congestion that presses on that bronchus, and then you get this cough. 
So we'll see it in dogs, usually small toy breeds that are 10 years or older. Uh, they get a cough. It's deep. It's resonant. It really doesn't tend to be productive. It just is a really loud cough with not bringing uh, anything up. Um, it's usually worse at night when they're lying down and they have more pressure in their chest or with exercise. Uh, dyspnea, tachypnea, also common. Um, decreased appetite. And we may hear a cyst or we often hear a systolic murmur in the left apex. Um, and it is a whooping quality, which means it has an increase in tone as it goes up. It goes whoop, 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 whoop. And that's what you'll hear. I'm going to go back to one slide. There's a video here that I want to show you. Um, and we'll bring that up and show it to you. This is a flail mitral valve. And it is a result of a, congest or a, a chronic uh, mitral valve insufficiency. Um, this happens to be in a, a person. Uh, with rheumatic fever and what we're seeing is the valve and it's trying to close all the way and you can see it's closing on this side but on this side it's not closing all the way because it's flapping up here see how it's flailing up there and it's not closing completely it's just waving in the breeze up here so it's going to show doppler here and blood should be flowing one direction and this shows that we have different colors so it's showing us it's flowing in both directions um, if it's not flowing in one direction, then you are going to have, that's MR is mitral regurge, um, you're going to have flowing in the opposite direction, um, which causes a black uh, backup. And that is due to rheumatic fever in this uh, gentleman. Uh, it's a human, but it is due to uh, mitral valve disease in um, in uh, animals, um, in dogs in particular. I'll bring that back up. And go to back where we were. Okay. And I apologize for that. Here is chronic mitral valve insufficiency. One big point that I want to make here. Um, why does this happen? Let's think about what it what it uh, happens in it. It happens in these in older dogs, small toy breeds. Think about these dogs. What do their mouths look like? They have really bad breath. So dental disease is actually the most common cause of chronic mitral valve insufficiency. The bacteria that's in the mouth that is causing that bad breath and the gingivitis and the periodontal disease gets into the bloodstream. There's lots of blood vessels right there in the mouth. And often they're damaged. And so bacteria can easily get in there. And when they get in there, the, the um, bacteria goes to the rest of the body, and one of the places it lands is on that mitral valve, and it causes the infection right there, and that's what we see uh, as the result, is this chronic mitral valve insufficiency. X-rays, if we see pulmonary edema, remember it's backing up into the lungs, so we'll see fluid in the lungs, um, and you'll see cotton-like alveolar densities or air bronchograms. If there's no edema, um, no fluid that's hiding it, you may see a left atrial and ventricular enlargement, elevation of the thoracic tra trachea, and a loss of the cardiac waste on lateral, uh, meaning that we have a rounder heart than normal. On a dorsal ventral view, you may see the enlarged left auricle or the left um, atrium, that, that elephant ear that comes off the left atrium at about two or three o'clock. On an uh, echocardiogram or uh, ultrasound, you'll see that increased diameter, be able to measure it. And you'll see a marked reduction in left ventricular contractility. You may be, see, may be able to see that mitral valve thickened or um, kind of even flailing. So this is a great x-ray to show you um, an example of what it, what it should, what it will look like on an x-ray. Here we have the spine and the trachea. And this is where the black part of the lung should be. In this case, we see fluffy white lungs. And that's where air should be, but it's full of fluid. And it's, it's um, x-rays are bouncing off that fluid and not getting to the plate like they would if they were just going through air. And that's why we can see it so clearly. Um, let's take a look at the artery and the uh, vein. If you look here, you see the artery and then the vein is about twice the size of the artery around this bronchus. Um, an air bronchogram 
looks like a donut. Here is a donut, and that's an air bronchogram. And this is um, uh, vessels around or edema around this um, uh, bronchiole, which has air running through it. So it looks like a donut. And here's the heart. Doesn't the heart look a little fuzzy? It, there's fluid around the heart. It's difficult to see it. You can um, see that there, there's a shadow, of a heart shadow, but it is enlarged. This, by the way, I don't know what that is, but it's in the colon. Um, it, or the stomach, it's kind of hard to tell, um, but this is a, a metal density or a stone density. So it's, I'm not sure what that is, but it's important to pay attention to that as well. This is a v, um, VD view, so a ventrodorsal view, the animal's lying on his back. The, um, when you place this animal to get a chest x-ray, like we just saw, um, like, well, I'm going to show you that in a second. This was a lateral view. This is a VD view. Um, that cross needs to be right between the armpits, okay? It's a little higher than you would expect. You need to collimate it so it's long enough to get up to the neck and down to the base of the uh, um, rib cage. And you want to collimate it a little bit better than this guy is collimated. It should be in closer to the body wall. I don't know, but I kind of think I see... Um, hands here without gloves on, and that makes me really nervous. You should always be wearing your PPEs when you're doing your x-rays. Here is a view that uh, you would see from taking that x-ray. Um, you can see it's correctly labeled as this is the right. We don't have any um, label indicating what animal this is, but that would be appropriate as well. This is a typical view. It's nice and straight. You see the sternum and the spine are lined up almost exactly. Um, this is the right side of the heart, this is the left side of the heart, and this is a fairly normal heart. And you can see the lungs are nice and black. There is a vessel coming down here that you can see. I don't know if you know what that is, but it should be the, pulmon or the uh, posterior vena cava. This is a cat chest. I wanted to show you this. It has, you can tell it's a cat because of the way it's shaped. It looks more like a triangle than a dog. Um, the heart is a normal size, um, but then again, we don't often see abnormalities in cats because they typically get hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which thickens on the inside of the heart and it doesn't show an increase on the outside of the heart. So treatment for chronic mitral valve insufficiency. The main goal is to improve length and quality of life. So we want to use diuretics or furosemide, Lasix, to reduce the circulatory blood volume to the left side of the heart. We can use arterial dilators like hydralazine or enalapril to increase, decrease the systemic resistance, increase the, the vessel size so it doesn't have to push so hard to get blood through those larger vessels. Digoxin will uh, decrease the heart rate to less than 160 beats per minute, and it's beating more strongly. Can, um, CMBI is a progressive disease, so we need to let clients know that we need to look at them serially, so not, not like a um, uh, shred of wheat, but, uh, you know, in time, we need to look at them several, you know, months apart and make adjustments to medications as needed. There is no cure for it, but a low-salt diet will help because it decreases fluid accumulation. We need to tell our clients to stop feeding table food and no treats and eventually medication will not be helpful. So there will come a time where we're gonna to have to make a decision. Tricuspid valve insufficiency, just like I said, it's like the mitral valve except it's on the right side. So instead of seeing pulmonary edema, fluid in the lungs, you're gonna see pleural effusion and that's fluid on the outside of the lungs. So you'll see the black lungs and fluid around it. You'll see abdominal distension or, and or hepatomegaly. So traffic is backing up into the abdomen and you may see GI signs like vomiting, diarrhea, and anorexia. Um, and that's just because we've got a lot of pressure in that, um, in that abdomen from the backup um, of the fluid. Um, treatment is the same as CMVI, and we may need to repeat abdominocentesis as needed uh, to remove the fluid from the abdomen so they can be more comfortable. EKGs, electrocardiographs. We do these regularly. Um, I think this is a kinkajou that they're doing one on. Um, this is a normal dog EKG. We can see the P 
wave, which is the um, indicates the movement of the electricity through the atria. And we see the QRS wave, which goes QRS. And that will give us the, um, uh, the size of the ventricle. And then we have the um, T wave. Uh, in, this, in this case, in the dog, it is um, below the line. It's repolarization of the heart. So we have depolarization of the atria, depolarization of the ventricles, repolarization of the heart, and it goes back into the same rhythm. So this is our, your P, P Q, R, S, T, uh, and it indicates how the electricity is moving through the heart of the dog. The cat's looks a little bit different, doesn't it? it um, often this is lead two, so this is one way of looking at it. This is also lead two, and it often goes the opposite way than you would see for a dog, and it's just how it's moving through the body, through the heart, and how the heart is positioned. Um, this animal obviously is under anesthesia and having an EKG. Remember, it's smoke over fire, so it's going to be on the left side black over red. On the right side, it's going to be white over green. Of course, EKGs are going to be much smaller. Um, this little fluttering in between is just movement um, uh, occurring within the in the body of the uh, horse. Um, there is a, there's an app for that. So on an iPad, there's an app in which you can get an EKG by placing it on the animal. This animal is has a halter monitor on, so it's living with this on to get a, an idea of what's going on with the heart within the heart um, every 24 hours. Uh, here we have a heart rate of 29, which is normal for a heart, uh, for, for a horse. Anywhere from 20 to 40 can be normal for a horse. Cardiac arrhythmias are any deviations from the normal heart rate or rhythm, or um, rhythms can be originating from abnormal locations within the heart, or it could be from an abnormal, which, well, that rhythms, those rhythms and the deviations can be from either an abnormal impulse formation, so it's coming from somewhere not the SA node, or abnormal impulse conduction in the cardiac muscle fiber. So it's not following the same track it usually does. Um, the altered impulse formation can be caused by a number of things. Ischemia, which is lack of blood flow to the heart. Hypocalcemia, lack of calcium available for heart contraction, muscle contraction. Cardiomyopathy hypercalcemia, too much calcium available, excess catecholamines or reperfusion injury. Alternate pathways do develop for repolarization of cardiac muscle. So the heart really wants to be in rhythm, but it, does, it can't always. So what? So what if we have a cardiac arrhythmia? Why does it always have to beat in the same rhythm? Well, arrhythmias affect hemodynamics. If it doesn't beat in the same way every time, we decrease blood flow. Um, primarily to the cerebrum, and that's our brain. We need blood flow there. So cerebral blood flow is decreased 8 to 12% by, by premature beats. It's decreased 14% by supraventricular tachycardias. Those are tachycardias that happen in the atria. 23% by atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation is when the atria is um, kind of fluttering but not really producing a beat which will contract the atria to push blood into the ventricles. And 40 to 75% by, uh, by ventricular tachycardia. So if the brain isn't getting blood, you're going to get syncope. What does syncope look like? There is a video of a dog here going through a syncopal episode. Um, and I would uh, suggest that you go ahead and watch this. You'll, you'll hear the dog breathing harder and harder as it goes up four flights of stairs. Now, um, the owner says she doesn't normally let this dog do it, but she's encouraging this dog, who doesn't know any different, to continue on to its home. So I guess it's one flight of stairs. It finally gets home, and all of a sudden it there's no blood getting to its brain and it just falls over. And that's fainting. That's a syncopal episode. Now she's going to help him out. So um, once he rests and he, he gets back to normal, but he has to be very careful uh, not to um, overstress himself. So 
That's that's happening because he have, has congestive heart failure, but it can also happen if we have an arrhythmia that's not allowing our heart to beat in the way it should should be beating. So atrial fibrillation, or uh, it's a supraventricular arrhythmia, atrial arrhythmia. Basically, there's no organized atrial contraction. Cardiac output will start to decline. It's not pushing blood through the heart. Um, this happens when there's no atrial kick, and then the ventricular rate will increase to try to make up for that. Um, a critical mass of myocardial tissue is required to sustain atrial fibrillation, so more li it's more likely in large breed dogs or dogs with diseases that increase heart size, so dilated cardiomyopathy. It may be atrial, so it's, um, the P wave is pat positive by abnor but or abnormal, or it could be junctional. The P wave is negative in Li2. It should always be rising above the line, but if it's negative, that we call that a junctional arrhythmia. The heart rate will usually exceed 160, 180 beats per minute in the dog, but the Q PQRST remains normal. Um, so everything looks normal, but will have an increased rhythm. The heart rate can be slowed by vagal stimulation, fear, excitement, exercise, anemia, or hyperthyroidism. Anything that um, causes that can cause this arrhythmia. So here's a couple examples of some abnormal EKGs. These are VPCs, they're uh, ventricular premature um, contractions. And basically what's happening is we have, um, here's a P wave and a, and a QRS, but this P wave is happening right on top of this QRS. And so it's not actually going P wave and going through the atria and contracting and um, contacting the AV node and then the AV node. It's not going in that order. What's happening is we're getting a stimulation to contract and it's not necessarily lining up with the ventricular contraction. And then the ventricular, ventricle feels like it needs to contract again. And so it, it does a contraction, but it's in the opposite direction. And so uh, seeing more of these VPCs can be dangerous. And we often see these VPCs when we have a, tra a traumatic event. Um, occasionally when they're under anesthesia, you can see these, but as long as you're not seeing more than six per minute, you're okay. But when you're seeing this many, that's, a, that's an indication that we have a problem. Sinus tachycardia is when we have an increased heart rate, tachy, tachy means increased, increased heart rate, faster than normal heart rate, and it's occurring um, secondary to the P wave. So the P wave is causing this tachycardia. Ventricular tachycardia occurs when we have the ventricle just deciding on its own to beat. Um, ventricular tachycardia very quickly leads to ventricular fibrillation, which if you remember atrial fibrillation does not contract enough to allow blood flow. Ventricular tachycardia leads to ventricle fibrillation ventricle fibrillation leads to death. And so whenever you see this ventricle, ventricular tachycardia, you need to be prepared um, to do something. So ventricular arrhythmias um, come from the fibers of the ventricle. The QRS is going to be wide and bizarre. It may not be related to the preceding P wave. Um, we may see it in large breed dogs with or without concurrent disease. Um, with ventricular arrhythmias, we'll see weakness and syncope. Um, they just can't pump enough blood to get to their cerebrum. Remember, it's, it decreases the blood flow to the cerebrum 40 to 75%. They will collapse. They'll have a rapid and irregular heart rate. We can auscultate that rapid irregular heart rate. We can also listen to the heart rate and feel a pulse or, or not feel a pulse, and that's going to that's indicate that the heart is beating, but we are not getting... Um, not getting enough blood to the rest of the body. EKG will show us no evidence of P waves. We'll have an irregular baseline, a rapid irregular heart rate. Um, the treatment, we, we need to slow the heart rate. We can't correct atrial fibrillation. Digoxin is our drug to slow the heart rate, but we have to be real careful. We don't stop the heart. We can also use, on the other hand, we can use calcium channel uh, blockers in dogs like um, dilatiazem or verapamil, which will slow atrioventricular node conduction and increase the refractory period. So refractory period just re um, is related to the period in which <clears throat> the heart muscle can no longer contract or, 
or can't contract for a certain period of time. So digoxin will slow the heart rate, but calcium channel blockers will also slow the heart rate. Here's some ventricular arrhythmias, um, atrial tachycardia. These, uh, this is supraventricular tachycardia um, and atrial premature contractions. Um, these are not specifically ventricular arrhythmias, they are um, atrial arrhythmias. Um, here we can see um, uh, atrial tachycardia or supraventricular tachycardia. These, this is tachycardia as well. We see a P, QRS. Um, this is, if you look at the P wave, it's not always in the same place in relation to the QRS. So that's an indication that we have a junctional or a um, uh, super, uh, I'm sorry, a uh, premature, a superventricular tachycardia. There is no cure for fibrillation. Heart disease will progress even with treatment. Congestive heart failure will develop. We need to do periodic exams and we want the client to report any GI upset, anorexia, diarrhea, any worsening of cardiac fun function like coughing, weakness, or, and collapse. And if there is an emergency, we need them to bring a list of meds. If you know anybody with heart, uh, heart condition, you know they're on a, a large uh, amount of heart um, medications and that's the same with uh, animals as well. This is sinus bradycardia. Brady means slowing of the, uh, the heart. Um, so this is a, a slow heart re uh, rate. And this can be caused by things like anesthesia. There can be a blockage within the electrical conductivity of the heart. Um, so some other things can cause sinus bradycardia. This is something called P mitral. The reason I remember this is this P wave is double. And so you're getting two contractions of the, um, uh, of the atria. And it doesn't usually cause a major problem. Tented T waves, this is important to remember because it indicates hyperkalemia, too much potassium. So it's, it, we see this a lot in cats that have been blocked for some time. And what happens is this T wave just goes off the chart because we have too much potassium adding that positive ion um, to the um, electric potential. So ventricular tachycardia is associated with cardiomyopathy, congestive heart failure, endocarditis, myocarditis, cardiac neoplasia, and electrolyte and acid imbalances. So anytime we see ventricular tachycardia, we know that we need to do some more digging, find out what's going on, some more diagnostics. It causes reduced ventricular filling time, which decreases cardiac output. If it's allowed to progress, it may lead to ventricular fibrillation, which I just discussed is life-threatening. It's a, equivalent to a cardiac arrest uh, because no blood is actually being moved into the systemic circulation. Um, ventricular fibrillation is the time when we pull out our defibrillator and shock the heart. Okay, so this is what um, ventricular tachycardia, these are actually VPCs and they're happening rather rapidly and it's gonna lead to ventricular um, fibrillation. Clinical signs of ventricular tachycardia, weakness, collapse, syncope and rapid heart rates, sudden death, congestive heart failure if it's a longstanding ventricular arrhythmia. Our diagnosis is through auscultation. We'll see an EKG and see those wide and bizarre QRS complexes. You should never forget what this VPC look like, looks like. Um, ventricular fibrillation means we have an abnormal baseline um, with no QRS. We have to treat it. We have to treat it very quickly. We use a, a cardiac fibrillation or a defibrillator, IV fluids, sodium bicarbonate, um, cardiopulmonary recession te techniques. There's a, a number of things that we need to do. If we have ventricular tachycardia or ventricular premature contractions, if we have greater than 25 per minute and if our heart rate is greater than 140 uh, beats per minute, if the breed is at risk for sudden death or if the clinical symptoms um, exist, we can treat, um, basically what we treat with is with a, a local anesthetic. And that sounds funny, but we give this local anesthetic intravascularly, uh, so in the vein, and it goes to the heart and it actually deadens that conductivity of the heart a little bit. So it stops that premature contractions and, and it forces that heart to go back into a normal rhythm. So lidocaine, procanamide, or uh, tokenide is what we will use in order to decrease that. Prognosis is guarded with ventricular tachycardia. We need to treat that underlying condition. With German Shepherd dogs and boxers, if they have ventricular tachycardia, they can experience sudden death. This is a sinus arrhythmia. You see beat, 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 beat. 
beat. Okay, that's an arrhythmia. That's not the same rhythm. So um, it's common and it's actually normal in certain dogs. So you want to listen to it. And if you hear it, the beat arrhythmically, look at the breathing. Because what happens is when they're breathing, you see a difference in vagal tone as the, as the lungs expand and as they exhale, you'll see a decrease in um, how the vagus nerve, um, we'll talk about this nervous system thing in a bit, but how that vagus nerve um, changes the heart rate. And so as they breathe in, the heart um, actually increases. And as they breathe out, the heart decreases. So um, that is a normal thing in dogs, especially deep chested dogs. Um, in uh, uh, sinus bradycardia, we will see this in large breed dogs and athletic or highly conditioned animals. If you think of joggers who are just um, monsters you know, running 50 miles, they have very, very slow heart rates. Uh, they have very, very strong heart, and the heart can pump more blood out each, each um, uh, pump that it gives, and so it doesn't have to beat very fast. Um, we can also see sinus bradycardia with increased intracranial pressure. So if we have increased pressure in the head, it will slow the heart down. And sometimes we see this with um, uh, head trauma or even anesthesia. We can also see it with hyperkalemia. And if you remember back to the slide a couple slides ago, what else we see with hyperkalemia? We'll see those tented T waves. So you want to look for those. We also see it with hypothyroidism, which decreases the metabolism of the animal, gastrointestinal disturbances, and that's due to the vagus nerve, which wanders through the gastrointestinal tract as well. Drugs will cause sinus bradycardia, especially sedatives. Anything related to increased vagal tone, so neck trauma, tumors, that kind of thing, anything that increases the vagus nerve will, will decrease the heart rate. So sinus bradycardia, clinical signs, usually we don't see any unless the heart rates are very low. Occasionally we'll see some episodic weakness, that's occasional weakness, syncope and collapse. We can diagnose it by just listening for it. We can feel it. Um, EKG, we'll see the slow rate, but we'll see a normal PQRS um, complex. For a technician, you need to remember not to overstretch the neck or otherwise traumatize that vagus nerve during intubation in brachio. Um, uh, cardiac, uh, brachiocephalic dogs or cats, what are brachiocephalic breeds, the short face breeds like pugs, Boston Terriers, English Bulldogs, Himalayans, Persians, and the cats. You want to be careful when you're intubating them. Treatment, there's none unless you have uh, clinical signs. Atropine is a drug that we use to increase heart rate. It kind of um, does the opposite of what vagus nerve does, and so it will increase the heart rate. Uh, propantylene bromide is another anticholinergic. Atropine is an anticholinergic, and it um, does the same thing, increases the heart rate. We can put a pacemaker in these guys, too. Um, sometimes this is normal in athletic dogs, so we don't worry too much about them. If there's concurrent problems, um, we need to correct it. Uh, but most dogs can live a normal life unless they have weakness or syncopal episodes. Okay. We're going to talk a little bit about heartworm disease and cardiovascular disease. Heartworm disease is a parasite, but it causes congestive heart failure or cardiomyopathy. And the severity of heartworm disease is related to the number of adult heartworms in that pulmonary artery. Now think back to that diagram of the heart and where that pulmonary artery was. It is on the right side coming out of the heart um, of the right ventricle. Most dogs can be asymptomatic and we find them during routine screenings, but some dogs come into us with cough or dyspnea, difficulty breathing, exercise intolerance. They're coughing up blood. They have signs of right-sided heart failure. And so we do a test, a positive antigen test, which is our um, SNAP test, um, uh, or we can do a positive concentration test that looks for those little microfilaria. X-rays, what will X-rays show? We'll actually see pulmonary changes that are consistent with that heartworm disease and right-sided failure right ventricular enlargement, increased prominence of pulmonary artery, enlarged lobar patterns. There's an increased paravascular pattern um, around the lungs. Um, there is a cowboy or a bow-legged effect uh, that these heartworms have in that when we look at the heart, we'll actually see um, major vessels going around the heart instead of um, uh, through one of the vessels should go kind of through the heart and be hidden by the heart. When we see that bow-legged appearance, we think heartworm disease. 
So treatment, we need to do a complete lab workup. We need to do a CBC, chem, thoracic rads, and urinalysis. Then we use melarsamine dihydrochloride, which is a miticide. It's an adult site, so it kills only the adult heartworms. We give it at 24 in hour intervals, but we're starting to give it one dose at the, at the first visit, and then a month later, give two doses 24 hours apart. That'll kill the heartworms in stages, and so the heartworms, as they die, sometimes group together and cause um, thromboembolytic uh, effects or the clots throughout the body, and that can be a major problem. We give these injections deep into the lumbar muscles that's on either side of the spine toward the back of the animal. Um, it, treatment is toxic. It causes respiratory distress, vomiting, panting, excessive salivation, diarrhea. Um, we can treat this diarrhea with uh, dimercaprol or bal oil. Uh, we do have to be careful with it. So it's much better to do a, um, uh, I'm sorry, it is much better to do a um, uh, preventive than it is to do a uh, treatment for heartworm. This is a normal chest of a dog and here's a dog with heartworm infection. In this chest, you can see right-sided failure causing pulmonary or pleural effusion. So this is fluid on the outside of the lungs. You can see the lung tissue, which is the black, kind of um, bordered with this fluid shadow here. And here's the heart. The heart shadow is much enlarged, and it seems to be mostly enlarged on the right side. You can see this enlargement on the right side. Um, this dog is twisted a little bit, so it's hard to tell really if that is. If you see these torturous vessels in the lungs, you see this vessel in particular is a torturous vessel, that's an indication that we have heartworm disease. And you can see this these vessels coming out, you should not be able to see those vessels. They're quite uh, prominent in this dog. So this is a dog with a heartworm infection. Um, so again, it's related, the severity is related to the number of adult heartworms in the pulmonary artery. Prevention is key, treatment is difficult, it's expensive, and it can have major complications. So we wanna prevent it. We can also, we also treat um, uh, with a microfilaricide, usually given three to six weeks after a melarsamine. Oh, we can give ivermectin as a single dose or milbamycin as a single dose. For collies, collies are very susceptible to ivermectin. They have a uh, what we call a leaky blood-brain barrier, and ivermectin will cause neurologic disease in them. Um, some of the uh, treatments uh, have changed a little bit since, um, since this book was published, and I will say that um, we are starting to give the microfilariside before we treat with the imidacide or the the um, adulticide treatment. Um, so as long as we know what's going on within the animal, we'll start with the uh, microfilaricide for three to four weeks. At the same time, we will give an antibiotic called doxycycline, which kills a bacteria that lives on the worm, the adult worm, and allows the adult worm to, it's a symbiotic parasite to the adult worm. So we kill that, then we're actually killing or making the, the adult worm die a little bit more easily, and we do that for a month, then we give one injection, and then we cage rest them for a month, and then we give them two injections 24 hours apart, and then we cage them for another month, and then we look for more microfilaria. Um, if we see it, then we give another uh, dose of the ivermectin and milbamycin. Feline, cats get heartworm disease as well, ferrets get heartworm disease. It is um, more deadly in cats than in dogs. Cats get it um, almost as routinely as dogs. Remember, cats go outside too, and mosquitoes come inside. So I don't care if your animals are only inside the house, you do get mosquitoes inside your house. They will see, you will see some coughing and dyspnea with heartworm disease in cats because of the pulmonary changes, but any cat with heart disease almost always will vomit instead of cough. I don't know exactly why that is, but it probably is related to the pressure on the vagus nerve. The cats with cardiac disease vomit. Um, so anorexia or weight loss uh, will be a sign, lethargy, right-sided congestive heart failure, sudden death is usually what we see, or acute development of neurologic signs, which is odd, but it, has, it relates to the, the, tr the travel of this um, heartworm that, that doesn't normally live within cats. Uh, feline heartworm test um, needs to have, they say two adult female worms, but sometimes it's hard to even get it with that. Um, usually at least three adult female worms. Um, cats with three adult female worms 
have significant heartworm disease. So it's very, very rare to get a positive heartworm test, antigen test. Now we can get an antibody test, but we do need to send that blood out to get that test. X-rays can be difficult to interpret. The echocardiogram ultrasound, I've actually seen adult worms on cats. And so it is possible to see these worms in cats. Not, not always, but you can. Treatment, there is no treatment. We can just hope that eventually all the adults will die and we can keep them on the prevention um, so that we don't get any more adults growing up. So if we can cage rest them, keep them on some prednisone to decrease the effects of the worms, um, maybe put them on some doxycycline, which is the antibiotic will, which will help the, the adults not to breed, and then some um, symptomatic treatment. Um, and hopefully the worms will die before the cat's heart disease gets much worse. That's what I have for cardiac disease. I know that was a lot of information. Basically, you need to think of this as plumbing or um, traffic. Uh, go through this uh, lecture again. Think of any questions you might have. Let's discuss it in class.